Next up, we have Professor Greg Bilo uh, of uh, Glasgow University, Research Director of the world-renowned Glasgow Media Unit for over 20 years, which has pioneered, among other things, new research techniques that reveal the complex ways in which audiences and publics are and indeed can be influenced by dominant media narratives. Greg. <laughs> I'm going to stand so I can get out of the way of the light. I keep feeling like I'm being interrogated on my past political affiliation. <laughs> Just in case I've said anything on Twitter, you know, it's not that I can work it very well. The mic! The mic! Give me the mic! I'll have the mic. Thank you very much. Look, I can walk with the mic as well. So, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, what I'd like to talk I'll speak more into the mic. How about that? I'll project. And uh, is everybody now able to hear? Is that okay? All right, okay. I want you to say thanks for coming tonight. I've just come down from Glasgow, where it's incredibly sunny and hot, so I feel a bit cold down here. That's a joke. I mean, if you, only, if you looked at the weather forecast, about 10 degrees apart. What I want to say to you is what can we do about this situation. We all know that the problems, we've all, every time we look at the media, we want to scream at it, we want to throw bricks at the TV. What can actually be done? I want to talk about three, very quickly, three areas. The first is, I think, it's very important for us on the left to use what space is available in the mainstream media. We are very good on social media, but that, in effect, is confined pretty much to 20% of the population in terms of real use and interaction on anything political, probably less than that. So the mainstream media is still critical for very many people. And what I found is when you ask people what they're looking at online, very often you know, people say, oh, I use the internet for my news. Uh, and then you say, well, what are you looking at? And they say, oh, the BBC website. You know, so actually it's the mainstream news they're picking up even when it's online. So how can we use the existing mainstream media? Now, I wouldn't tell anyone to get their hopes up because we know the difficulties and the problems. But nonetheless, there is some space. Papers like the Daily Mirror, even the Sun, watch their own readerships. They're very concerned about their readerships. So it, they must, to some extent, for commercial reasons, uh, represent a, a range of views, even if it's not the editorial policy. So it's a very important thing for us as a movement to keep feeding in material as much as we can to those, to, to those sources. A second issue, and I'll speak quick because we can do five minutes, but a second key issue is the mass membership. That in an extraordinary development, we now have probably over 500,000 members in the Labour Party. Now that is an, is an astonishing thing to have happened. So those people need to make their voices very clear into the mainstream media and to use what public space there is. And that means things like phone-in programs, of which there are huge numbers. Uh, it means local programming. It means texting to news services, so the text runs along the screen. It means phoning up the Jeremy Vine show, things like that, and a constant battering into the media and saying, no, you're not representing what people think. There's all these ideas that are there out in the society which are not being represented. Why don't you focus on people's desire for rail nationalisation, for public ownership, not just rail, for electricity, gas, all of these things. What, you know, to keep going and going and pushing into those spaces is so important. And it really does work. I, one of the exercises I do with my students at Honours Students is simply to say to them, use as much space as you can, do, you can, get as much as you can into the media. And one of, the things that, one of the things they do is simply to write letters, which is extraordinary, to the Daily Express, to the Daily Mail. And they, they're published, because what they write is, uh, I'm a young university student and a very enthusiastic reader of the Daily Express. <laughs> But I can't help wondering if the biggest scroungers are not the people who are on Social Security, but the hedge fund managers who, etc. And the letter goes in because it's from a young university student. The Daily Express is desperate to get anybody under 50 to read it. 
and the Daily Mail and all of these papers actually print these extraordinary radical letters that my students write. And I'm, I was astonished. I thought they might get one in, but I mean, they covered the media unit with these letters. So it's so important to, to use that, to take that up. Another key issue for the mass membership, in my view, is to organize people to go out literally and, and be a, and appear in public, you know, to bang on doors, to be in public spaces, to talk to people in shopping centers, to give out alternative information, and for us to brief these people with, with the best, latest arguments that, that we can give them. It seems to me absolutely critical. And that, I, because I live in Scotland, I watched this happen with the with the independence referendum. Now, I, I was on the no side, but I have to say to you that it was an astonishing sight to watch this army of young people. I mean, this SNP now has 110,000 members. You, it's an astonishing organization of people. And, and I watched these people and, and read their accounts. Many of them were my ex-students. And I, I read what they were doing on Facebook, because I'm on Facebook with them. And they would list how they'd gone out every night after night after night, you know, for six hours at a time, seven hours sometimes, all day. And they would say how many people they'd spoken to, how many doors they'd knocked on, how many people. And they moved that vote from 30% up to 45%. I mean, it was in the, in the teeth of the most ferocious media criticism. And it was an extraordinary sight. Now, that kind of interactive politics where people talk to other people is absolutely critical. It's something we need to move towards. And the last thing I'll say is that the BBC must be held to account. Yeah. It's a public body. We own it. We pay for it. It must represent our views as well as the proper range of political views. That's its job, that's its charter, it is bound to do that. It is not acceptable for it to uh, conduct itself in the way that has been so well measured by Justin and, and many other uh, people now who have you know, LSE, Birkbeck, again and again it's been found that it is behaving in a way which is really quite outrageous. And it has to be called out for that. And I think each time any of us, or any of the spokesmen for our movement, for our people, go on to the BBC, they have to point to those research findings and say, this is not acceptable. When are you going to represent a proper range of views? And they need to be called out on air publicly. And that's one of the functions of phoning up, doing the phone-ins, constantly writing and arguing and insisting that the BBC does its job properly. And I'll hold that there, but I'll just say one last word. This is a difficult moment for us. There's all kinds of problems. The, the Labour Party is going through a, a strange and tumultuous period. But to turn around a battleship takes a long time. Don't be surprised that it's difficult, arduous, and takes time. And don't expect always to win. But always, always go on. Okay.